first of all, who am I? Uh, what right do I have to talk about voice acting? Where is my experience? Uh, what, what, what do I do? Um, so I'm JD Kelly. Uh, I've done voice acting in a lot of different video games. Uh, I've done everything from AAA games, big studio games, all the way down to uh, small, tiny indie games. Uh, I also do voice acting in audiobooks, uh, advertisements, commercials, animation, uh, film, various other things as well. I do on screen acting as well, but voice acting is where my passion lies. That's where I enjoy uh, the work more than uh, screen acting. I like screen acting too, but voice acting is my, my passion. Um, so yeah, there's a smattering of some of the jobs I've done up on screen. Uh, uh, the Warplanes, World War One, and Warplanes, World War Two. I did voiceovers on their uh, uh, advertisements and, and did some sort of character voice acting there. Uh, the Soul Sonata, I played one of the main characters, Emperor Chase. Um, Steel Division Normandy 44, I was the UK Transport Commander, uh, it's like a top-down RTS. Uh, Phantasmal City of Darkness, I was the main character, the player character in that, called John Hope. Uh, and a variety of other things and stuff, you can find a lot of my credits online. So yeah, I've been working in, in voice acting for about 10 years. Uh, for about the last three or four years, it's been a full-time employment. Uh, it's my main source of income. It's my day job. I get up in the morning and I go into my office and uh, it's a small home studio office where I've got soundproofing on the walls and things. And I sit in front of a microphone and talk to myself in a padded room all day. Um, so this is where my experience has come from, from doing this. I, I, I sometimes go out to studios to do voice acting. So I get invited out to studios in London, in Bristol, and various other places, Cardiff, and uh, uh, I'll voice act for other people in their studios, and then they do all the processing and editing. Um, but I also do a lot in my own studio where I record, edit, process, send it out to the client, and then they take, with, take it and do what they will. Um, to me, it's the best job in the world. I get to go to, go to work wearing my pajamas half the time, which is lovely. Uh, I, I get to keep a full beard and not change my haircut very often, except for when I want to. Um, so that beats screen acting for me. Uh, also, screen acting, I'm limited by the physical form. Uh, so what you see is uh, exactly the characters that I can play, whether it's voice acting, because I can turn my voice to many different uh, highs and lows and gravels and smoothness and a uh, variety of different accents. I'm not limited in terms of the characters that I can play as much. So I can play the muscle-bound hero, or I can play the two-foot-tall gnome, or the seven-foot-tall minotaur, or, you know, it, it really doesn't matter. It, it, it gives me a lot more variety of roles that I can play, and I really love that aspect of it. And that's part of what, uh, part of the reason I fell in love with voice acting. Uh, so that's where my experience lies. That's where I'm coming from. Uh, I, I started from doing on-screen acting uh, just for friends, amateur filmmakers and things like that. And uh, they, those projects sort of teared up and then uh, a voice acting project came up on uh, available and they said, do you want a role in this? And I was like, yes, of course, that sounds great fun. And it was more than great fun. It was a, an amazing experience and something I loved. And then I just went, well, how much more can I do with this? What else can I do? Um, anyway, uh, I'll move on from there. So uh, in terms of the talk, uh, what am I going to be covering today? What am I going to be talking about? Um, so there's three sort of main sections that I want to run through. First of all is uh, the process of, of, of voice acting in terms of where do we start in terms of using your voice zone? So practice, learn, and study. Uh, are, are the kind of cornerstones of, of, of what I teach. So practicing your voice, using it over and over again, and uh, uh, getting good at your craft. Uh, learning, as in studying voice acting, learning about where it's useful, how to uh, improve it. And, uh, and, and in terms of study, uh, by that I mean studying other voice actors and other roles and seeing what they do and extrapolating from that, which I know it kind of falls under learning as well, but uh, learning, I mean, as a passive experience and studying me, I more mean as an interactive experience. 
Uh, I'll then move on to the help section, which is things like where to get jobs, how to get paid and pricing, um, by which I mean sort of things like some people use websites, some people use um, agents or coaches, um, how to get paid in terms of like, when do I charge? Uh, how much should I do this job for? What sort of jobs should I do? Uh, pr pricing in terms of like, when I do get these jobs, how much do I charge? Uh, and then it, it, and, and then, then it's like, if it's a, for a larger company that can afford more, should I charge more? Uh, sh I've been offered this job, but they will uh, put me out on social media. Should I do that? And, and things like that. Uh, I'll then move on to uh, what I consider a conclusion part of it, but I'll talk about things like uh, your health. Uh, and I don't just mean physical health, I mean mental health as well. Um, looking after yourself, looking after your voice, uh, and then uh, how to... Uh, build a network around yourself that so you can improve your craft and improve your well-being uh, and ultimately keep doing this job for a longer period of time. So uh, let's start at the beginning. What is a voice actor? What does a voice actor do? Uh, so in terms of voice acting, what I'm talking about here is I will talk about voice acting in general. Obviously, this is a more video game specific uh, talk, which is why I'm doing it on Twitch initially uh, and why. I do it at EGX. Um, in terms of voice acting, commonly you're sitting in front of a, or standing in front of a microphone, uh, depending on what kind of read you're doing. Uh, sometimes you'll be doing things like mocap, where you wear the uh, Zentai suits with bobbles all over them or marks all over them. Uh, sometimes you'll do things like screen, uh, facial capture. So they'll put dots on your face or they'll have a uh, essentially a big boom microphone with uh, a camera here and the camera records your face whilst you're doing things. Uh, there's a lot of different aspects to voice acting. So when I say voice acting, it's not just about your voice. Uh, there is some physicality to it as well. Uh, and especially when doing things like efforts, uh, efforts are the noises a character makes when they do things like swinging a sword or uh, getting hit by a bullet or jumping up on a ledge. So you get the sort of uh, 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 kind of noises. Um, when you're doing voice acting, they're called efforts. Uh, and with efforts, if you just stand in front of a microphone and grunt into it, that will give you an aspect of it for sure. Um, but if you do some of the physical motion as well, provided it's not causing too much noise on the microphone, then your efforts will sound more real because what you are doing is more real. Uh, essentially, that that realism of actually going through the physical motion will mean that your vocalizations of that physical movement will be more natural. Because uh, essentially when we're doing physical movements or actions in real life, you don't listen to yourself. You don't consciously think about, oh, I make this noise when I swing a sword because how many swords have you swung? If you're a, a LARP or, or a medieval rp -er, then don't answer that question. Uh, but generally, the majority of people haven't swung a sword and uh, haven't listened to themselves when they've climbed up on a ledge or gone up a ladder or anything like that. Um, so that awareness is certainly in there. I, I do think that voice actors are actors. So the physical aspect of acting uh, is important even for voice actors. Um, so like I said, a lot of people come from different uh, positions. Some people have done things like uh, YouTube and talks, talking on YouTube whilst playing games, and they go, oh, I want to also do voice acting. Some people are actors and want to do voice acting along with their acting to improve their skill set. Some people have just been told they've got a great voice or a funny voice when they do sort of um, funny voices to, you know, telling bedtime stories to their kids or nieces or nephews or, or whatever. Um, some people just love either animation or video games and go, I want to do that. I want to be part of that world. And that's certainly an aspect to, to it as well. So with voice acting, you can come from many different positions, and I don't think any of them are wrong. Um, things like some people come to it from a point of view of uh, uh, impressions as well, and all of these different approaches Moving on to voice acting, there are transferable skills, even if it's just telling stories to, to kids or, or, or friends and things like that, or being told you've got a, a great voice. It, it's just a starting point. And 
you can take those skills and build upon them and you can grow your abilities uh, in order to get better as a voice actor and that's part of what what we'll go into uh so going on with that a, a big thing i talk about is becoming comfortable with your voice and becoming uh aware of your own voice uh and you'll you'll see this little lovely picture of beethoven uh and be going why have you got a picture of beethoven he was a classical composer that's kind of an odd thing the reason i have beethoven on there is that uh, towards the end of beethoven's career as a uh, composer he actually went mostly deaf almost entirely deaf and a lot of people wondered because after that point he still released several uh compositions and they're like how did he do that and what beethoven did was he took a pencil uh, or a small wooden rod and he'd clench it between his teeth and push it into the uh, piano so that when he played the piano, the vibrations from the piano would travel through that rod into his jaw, which would come up to his ear. And even though his ears were blocked and he couldn't hear, he could feel the vibrations in his ear and still get the tune of the piano to continue writing music. The reason that's important, you, as again, you're like, why well, don't... Am I going to need to do that for voice acting? No, you're not. Don't worry about that. Uh, but a lot of people, when they start out, they record their own voice. They listen to it back and go, that's not what I sound like. That sounds horrible. I hate the sound of my own voice. Uh, a lot of YouTubers talk about that as well. When they first start doing YouTube and they don't want to watch their own videos because they listen back to it and go, oh, this is, this, is, this is weird. I don't like watching myself or listening to myself talk. And uh, essentially, the more you do voice acting or, or the more you record your voice and listen back to it, this perception adjusts. And essentially what you're doing is, is when you speak into a room, you will hear the reflections back of the room. You'll hear your voice projecting out combined with the voice uh, resonating in your own jaw and in your own head in, around your ears. So your perception of what your voice sounds like is a combination of all of these things. When you're hearing your voice on a recording, you're just hearing it from a single source. And essentially, the more you listen to that single source, the more you'll become aware of your own voice. And the more subconsciously your brain will filter it so that when you hear your voice in the room and through your own head's resonance, it will still be that same voice. The two things become merged, and that's when you are becoming more aware of your own voice. And the more aware of your own voice you are, the more control you can have over it, because you'll know what you sound like to a client. You'll know how to push your voice, whether to make it more gravelly or deeper or higher and more clear. And that control will translate into the audio that comes out of the speaker. Uh, rather than what you think you sound like in your own head. Uh, so practice and listening to your own voice, recording yourself over and over and getting comfortable, getting used to your own voice is extremely important when you're starting out. And I would say even for when you are further along the line, when you continue to learn, always record, record every day and listen back to it. And when you do that, you can, uh, without being overly critical, you can uh, critique your own voice and work on it and go, okay, well, if I want to do this better, I should push it with more gravel, more breath, less breath. Uh, I'm creating a lot of plosives. Uh, plosives are the sound of P's and T's and B's. And it's all of these breath noises hitting a microphone. Um, so uh, you'll become more aware of those and more in control of those. When you're a voice actor or, or YouTuber or whatever, uh, I would say record your voice and listen to it and um, listen to it in depth. Think think about it from the point of view of somebody else listening to you. Uh, and the more you do it, the more aware you'll be. Uh, so moving on from there, like I say, voice acting is acting and record every single day. Uh, the more days you wake up, go into your studio or uh, go to whatever space you have uh, and record yourself, the more practice you have. Uh, essentially, uh, what experts say 
is that practice takes 21 to 66 days to become habitual. So if you do things every single day for that length of time, it becomes a habit. It becomes part of your normal day and it will start to feel weird if you don't do it. Uh, and that's kind of a good way to get started in voice acting, because even if you're doing it uh, part time to start with after work, just think about like, OK, when after work, after school, can I come home and start doing it? And I'd say the same thing about being things like a streamer or a YouTuber. Make it a regular part of your life. Make it something that you do all the time uh, and it becomes habit. It becomes normal to do. And, and that takes away some of that effort and some of that difficulty when starting a new task um, because it becomes your normal task, like waking up and brushing your teeth every day or or putting on a fresh t-shirt or whatever. Uh, it's just part of your normal day-to-day -day routine. Uh, and they also say it takes 10,000 hours to become an expert at something. Uh, practiced for 10,000 hours and you'll become an expert. Now, I'm not saying that if you sit in front of a microphone and voice act for 10,000 hours, you're suddenly become, going to become an expert. Uh, you still need to put in the effort of learning and improving and being taught and uh, brainstorming and getting getting better at your craft and analyzing your craft. Um, but putting in those man hours, putting in those work hours to improve will certainly show off. And it, and it is a time investment. Uh, and a lot of people talk about time being money. And although, yes, an aspect of that is true, um, also time is just time. And if you use that time wisely, it can lead to the fruits of your endeavor. It can lead to improvement. Uh, and I've also put on here, read aloud, impersonate, redub, reimagine. Uh, when I talk about recording every day, uh, some people when they're starting out won't have something to record. And they'll be like, well, well, you say get in front of a microphone every day. What do I do? Do I just talk gibberish into a microphone? And I say, no, uh, get a book off the shelf, uh, find an article online. Uh, just something, voice it. Um, doing things like books is great because uh, even if it's not beyond copyright, don't put it out to the public world if it's not. You don't want to breach somebody's copyright. Um, but just think about a book that your kids would like, your nieces would like, your nephews would like, your cat would like, you know, and just or, or something that you want to listen to uh, before you go to bed at night and do that. And it'll just give you practice in front of a microphone. It'll give you experience in front of a microphone. It'll give you experience reading and voicing at the same time. Uh, and it'll help you develop your craft. Uh, I talked about impersonations before. Uh, impersonations are another aspect of it. Uh, and although in voice acting, it's rare to be asked to do a direct impersonation. I would say impersonations is a section of voice acting, but isn't always relevant to voice acting as a whole. What you will get is castings where somebody's like, oh, I want the voice to sound something like, and then they'll give you a character or um, something that they want it to be like. Uh, so it can help you with getting used to uh, voice acting characters' voices and finding something similar. Impersonation can also help improve your repertoire of the types of voices you can do. Um, so by attempting to emulate other voices, you're adding aspects of that voice to your own repertoire. Uh, and things like redubbing and reimagining is really good fun as well. So uh, obviously there are many, many animated uh, series from other countries that have been dubbed into English in the early days where the dubs were not fantastic, which is why a lot of people say subs, not dubs. Um, although I... I personally think that there are some great sub dubs and there are some great subs and you find whatever works for the current project you're on. Um, you can always find a, a dub that you don't like and redub it. Put your own voice on it. That's why there's so many fan dubs uh, on things like Casting Cool Club uh, and stuff like that because uh, people want it to be of good quality and for dubs to be watchable and make it uh, accessible to other people. Uh, Reimagining is also another great thing as well. Uh, things like uh, imagining, you know, what if uh, the Lord of the Rings was read aloud by Kylo Ren? You know, it, it, one of my favorite quotes from a movie were, you know, all read by Danny DeVito. You know, you can 
play with these things, have fun with it, inject some humor into it, entertain yourself, and, and just just enjoy voice acting. Not necessarily to take those um, files and put it out in the world, uh, but just to be working on your own craft, listening back to it, improving upon it, and going from there. Um, as well as audiobooks, poetry is a good thing as well. Think about uh, if the poetry was uh, read aloud by an American, an English person, a Scotsman, uh, whether it's somebody with a gravelly voice, an old man, a young man, and you can work on your own craft in that way. So that's that's a helpful way to do those things. Uh, another aspect of practice is improving your voice by doing things like uh, voice exercises uh, and tongue twisters. Uh, I really love finding tongue twisters uh and uh, I, i'll i'll say my favorite one is i wish to wash my irish wristwatch uh things like red lorry yellow lorry red lorry yellow lorry red lorry yellow lorry uh there's classics like she sells seashells on the seashore peter piper picked a pack of pickled peppers um but all of these things help loosen up your mouth loosen up your tongue uh, get you used to wrapping your mouth around difficult sentences uh some of the scripts you'll receive will have Tongue twisters, which when you read is fine, but when you try to speak them aloud, uh, it can be tricky. So the more practiced you are at working your mouth, your tongue, your uh, verboseness around these tricky subjects, the easier it'll be when you actually have to do it in practice. Um, I talk about singing quite a lot with people who are interested in voice acting. Uh, becoming a singer uh, can help you with things like breath control. Uh, again, being aware of your mouth, positioning your tongue, positioning in your mouth. Uh, it can help you get through longer sentences. Uh, I've also seen a lot of people, voice actors, doing things like uh, diving control, breath control, either through things like meditation or learning to hold their breath for longer periods of time for things like free diving and stuff like that. Uh, all of these ways of becoming aware of your breath, uh, even things like uh, taking up something like running or aerobic exercise. Again, it improves your lung capacity, your breath control, and therefore your tone control. And again, singing helps with tone control. Uh, if you're aware of uh, melody in your voice, it can help you with more melodic accents. Things like the Irish accent has quite a melodic flow to it. Uh, certain American accents have melodies to them. Uh, you can also be more aware of things like uh, voices and accents that become more monotone as well, that have a one note structure to them. Uh, and you can kind of push that more and become aware of those kinds of voices. Uh, I've also put on these two things, two little exercises, which I really like doing as well, which is I never said she stole my money, which has seven words in that sentence. And with those seven words, it has seven meanings. So I never said she stole my money, which means somebody else said that statement. I never said she stole my money, which means this is a sentence I've never said. Um, I never said she stole my money. Might have written it down, might have texted it, but I didn't say it. I never said she stole my money. It was somebody else. He stole my money. I never said she stole my money. I gave the money to her. Uh, she uh, was entitled to it. It was her money in the first place. You know, you, you don't know. Uh, I never said she stole my money. It wasn't my money. It was somebody else's. I never said she stole my money. Because chances are she stole my heart. Uh, so these kind of exercises, putting emphasis on the different words in a sentence can help you again when reading a sentence to work out what the meaning is. Again, depending on the script you're given, some sentences will have multiple meanings like this. And within the context of that script, on the fly, you'll need to figure out what that meaning is uh, whilst you're doing the voice acting. I mean, ideally, you get to read a script before you voice it uh, with plenty of time so you can prepare, you can do readings, and you can get ready for it. Um, but sometimes you just get given it on the day. Go, here you go, away you go. Um, so again, having your mind ready to work around those sentences to work out what they mean, uh, it's really useful skill to have and something that's worth practicing. And I find this a great way of doing it. And also practicing the delivery of those different meanings 
of that sentence as well, uh, putting emphasis on different words so that when you get a director that says, oh, can you emphasize, put the emphasis on this word rather than that one? Uh, again, you're more aware of your own voice and you can you can do that. The same thing with the sentence below, uh, which is she told him that she loved him. You can put the word only in between any of the words in this sentence and it changes the meaning of the sentence. Uh, she only told him that she loved him. She told only him that she loved him. She told him only that she loved him. She told him that only she loved him. And, and so on. You get the idea. Uh, and again, uh, sometimes you'll get uh, scripts which are translated from other languages and some of the translation goes awry and you need to work your way around that. Uh, sometimes uh, just copyright errors make mistake and, and you need to figure out what needs to go in there and work with the director and work with the script writer in order to get the right meaning of the words across. Um, and again, it's just practicing things like putting emphasis on words, working your way through a sentence. Uh, it can help you just with acting. Uh, the context of these sentences means that when you do change these words around, it creates a different scenario, a different imagined scenario in your head. So you can try and deliver these things with honesty and practice and, and really make somebody feel something out of this. So this is a great exercise to do. So this brings us on to learning. Obviously, learning is a huge part of voice acting. Uh, it's not just sitting in front of a microphone and doing the voice acting. Uh, away from that, you need to constantly work on your craft. You need to learn uh, sort of what is popular in voice acting at the moment, what is helpful in voice acting in the moment, uh, where is voice acting going as an industry. Uh, things like uh, online uh, webinars, uh, blogs, vlogs. There are so many voice actors now on YouTube uh, all the way from amateur to professional who are putting out the best advice that they can. Uh, obviously, you've got to sift through what you feel is useful information and not useful information. Uh, and sometimes distinguishing between that is difficult. Uh, looking on social media can help a lot. You've got a lot of voice actors, professional voice actors now on social media talking about their craft. Go back through their social media, see what they've see what advice they've put out into the world before. Uh, you can always search via their username and the word advice and see what comes up as well, and that can help. Uh, if you look at things like webinars, look at where those webinars are coming from. Are they coming from a small company that haven't had a lot of experience, or are they coming from a large company that has tons of experience? Who's on this webinar? Who's giving the talk? Where are their credentials? Where they come from? And just be aware of where this information comes from. And Ultimately, it's going to come down to you making your own decisions and your, your own judge as to what is useful and what is not useful. You've got to be careful to find out good information, uh, but there is good information out there that you can find for free. Uh, there's also information that you can pay for. Um, there's uh, companies like uh, Gravy for the Brain. Uh, you can sign up to their initial site for free. Um, there is a paywall behind a whole bunch of other advice, but they they do uh, some free webinars occasionally that uh, come up that give you again the basics of voice acting, home setups, um, technology, that kind of thing. And there's a whole bunch of sites out there that offer that kind of content. Um, I know things like Voices.com have their series of they've got a, like a podcast and they've got some video diaries. They've got YouTube videos with uh, advice again on starting up with voice acting. And uh, again, you can look online, you can find a lot of these things, just be aware of where they come from. Is this good advice? And ask that question of yourself and ask other voice actors who may be able to give you advice of what's good and what's not. Uh, you can also go to in-person talks. Like I say, I do talks at EGX, either at ResD, and I've done them at main EGX. Um, I was going to be going to Insomnia 66 this year. I'm hoping to make it to Insomnia 67. Um, so I'll be there chatting to people. And hopefully I'll be able to do some talks there in the future as well. Uh, I also do things like portfolio reviews. So people queue up and they show me what they've done so far. They get one-to-one -one advice and um, sort of some mentorship at, the, at uh, those events, which is really cool. And there's a lot of other voice actors that do that work as well. Uh, I've been to a lot of uh, Sally Beaumont, Beaumont's talks at EGX before, and, and she's incredible. Um, and uh, yeah, just, just 
look around for in-person talks and things like conventions and uh, meetups and so on and so forth from there. You can also pay for classes. A lot of uh, professional voice actors do paid for classes. They do sort of workshops in various places. I know there's a lot that happen in London, New York, LA, Texas, so on and so forth. Uh, peer learning is a great thing. So learning from your peers when you're doing jobs. Some of the great uh, voice acting and general acting advice I've had have has been on set where uh, in between takes on films, I've just been hanging around with other actors and we've talked about the craft, talked about how to improve. We've read lines together. We've learned from each other and, uh, you know, talked about, oh, I've still, I saw this role that you did. How did you access that information? And how did you get into that emotional space? And talking to other actors. Uh, a lot of people talk to me about uh, voice acting and why I do uh, talks, uh, online content, uh, portfolio reviews, and why I'll, I do all of those things for free. Um, and the reason I do those things for free is because I'm not competing with any of you. Uh, I, I don't compete with other voice actors. Uh, even if you found someone with, with a very similar voice to my own, it's not going to be the same voice. And even if it was, for some miraculous reason, the same voice, we're not going to work in the same way. We're not going to interpret a script in the same way. We're not going to get our heads into a character in the same way. Everybody's different. And it's up to the casting director and it's up to the people making the decisions on who is in that role to decide whether I fit that role or not. Uh, and it's the same with the other actors. We may have a very similar voice, but if our interact if our interpretation of the script is different, then one of us is going to get the job over the other. Not because we're any better or worse of a voice actor, but just because we're different, which is why we don't compete. Um, if you get two bands playing their own songs together, uh, having them in a competition is kind of odd because you're not judging them on their musicianship or their songwriting. It's all of it, all of it all together. Uh, if they were all playing the same song, maybe you could judge them on just their mus musicianship. Um, but if they interpret the song differently, you're going to like their interpretations differently as well. Um, so again, it's not a direct competition. It's not a direct comparison. It doesn't work like that to me. To me, we should all be learning off of each other and building up voicing, voice acting as an industry into a, uh, a larger thing, to a more a mainstream job. Uh, because the bigger the industry, the more stable the industry, the more jobs there will be for us, and uh, the more support net, the more of a support network there will be for us in future. So studying others, study is a big part of this as well. Uh, when I talk about learning, you are passively learning from other people. When I talk about study, it means that you can take this more into your day to day life. Uh, so when you watch things like movies, animation, when you play a video game. The more you work in voice acting, the more you sort of voice acting experience you have, the more you'll start going, ah, oh, that's a really cool voice. I wonder how they did how they did that. Um, or when you watch things like a, a, a Marvel movie, a, a Marvel comic books movie, uh, you'll say, oh, wait a second. Yes, Taika Waititi may be in person doing uh, some of the voices for these characters, a giant rock creature, but... Uh, obviously, they may have dubbed a lot of these in. When you're seeing uh, actors talking in an outdoor scene where it's noisy, often that's a dubbed voice acting over the top. So they'll be lip syncing with themselves, their voices over the top. Uh, and that in itself is a skill as well. Uh, when you're looking at animations, you might go, oh, I wonder how they got the voice to sound just like how that character looks. And it's the same with video games. So the more you look at voices in media, the more you'll become aware of it. And you can do things like look at DVD extras for uh, things like Disney animations, Studio Ghibli animations, or, and uh, variety, varieties of anime. Uh, and you can do the same thing with uh, video games as well. Uh, there's a screenshot up on the screen at the moment from Alan Wake. And uh, in Alan Wake, they do a video commentary mode. So you can play through the whole game again. And they do a picture in picture where uh, a little video screen comes up and they talk about things like the voice actors they were involved in, the artists who were involved in making the game, 
uh, the animation studios, the live action segments that they did uh, in order to have things like part of the cutscenes in the game and some of the video that you see on the TVs in the game are actually done live and then they put that video in the game. So the more you look at these things, the more you become aware, not just of voice acting, but things like the video game industry as a whole. If you start looking at uh, making of and documentaries about video games, you become aware of the process of making a video game. And the more aware of other people's jobs you are, the better you can provide your voice to them in a cohesive manner. Um, there's a, a YouTube channel called No Clip. Uh, they do some great documentaries about video games. Uh, some of them touch on voice acting in aspects, uh, and they talk about the whole process of making video games and how that happens and the journeys that they go on, uh, sometimes traumatic journeys, but uh, often interesting journeys uh, and how that works. And so if you're aware of things like a development cycle for a video game, uh, you can be aware of where a voice actor fits into that development cycle. Uh, for instance, I have I did voice acting last year for a game with some prominent voice actors and uh, some, well, one in particular, very large YouTuber who did voice acting on the video game as well. Uh, it The video game was having final touches put on it whilst we were doing the voice acting. And the final crunch for the video game happened. It's been ported to consoles as well. So that'll be coming out hopefully in May, although uh, COVID may push that further. Um, but I can't talk about it. I'm under NDA. For over a year, I've been under NDA about this game, which I really want to be able to talk about, but can't. Uh, and that's just part of the development cycle. Things like being under non-disclosure agreements, which is what an NDA is, uh, means that you can't publicly talk about something you've been involved in until it is released. I'm under an NDA for another video game, which I did at the beginning of the year, which is about to come out, and then I'll be able to talk about it, which would be great. Um, and it it's interesting to be aware of those development cycles about how some of them can be longer, some of them can be shorter. Uh, and know where you fit in so that your expectations of what you're doing versus when you can talk about it or, or what you're doing and delivering it on time and in a good format for them to use. And when a developer says to you, can you get this to me quickly? We're in crunch right now. You'll know, okay, they're in crunch. It's the last few months or weeks of their development cycle. I need to get this out to them swiftly so that they can implement it into the game and test it before launch. Um, so yeah, that awareness is, is helpful in the video game industry, but similarly in animation and uh, in film as well, being aware of the, the process of putting it together can be helpful in developing your awareness as a voice actor. So putting it in practice. Uh, putting it in practice uh, is a difficult one. Uh, I've put three things on here, each of which could be an entire talk on their own. Uh, so gear. Gear is a huge topic. Uh, when I started out, I had a USB blue snowball microphone. Uh, it cost less than £100. and It was awful, but it gave me a start. It was better than the microphone on this webcam, which is what you're hearing right now. Um, so it was good, but it wasn't great. But it was a start. It meant that I could do some amateur projects. I could do things like casting call club for uh, people putting together fan dubs or whatever. And it was just a, a way to start the practice. It gave me a lot of experience in front of a microphone, developing things like microphone technique. It gave me uh, the start of how to record myself, how to edit myself. How can I take this bad audio and make it sound better? Uh, and onwards from there, as soon as I could, I upgraded to a decent, proper microphone, an audio interface, and that going into my computer, and got proper software. And I would recommend doing that as soon as you're able to. You can start out with the cheapest thing in the world, but as soon as you can, I would always recommend upgrading to something decent. Uh, I've got a Focusrite Scarlett 2i2 as my um, audio interface. I think the Focusrite gear is really good. 
the Scarlet series is fantastic. They do a, a bundle of a of their version of the Rode NT1, which is what I've got. Um, they do their own proprietary version of it uh, as a bundle with the Scarlet series of audio interfaces, which keeps the costs down a little bit because it's in a bundle. Um, or you can go out and get a decent microphone. I wouldn't go out and spend £600 on a microphone. It's too much to start with. The jump in quality is not going to be noticeable at the, at the beginning, but I would make a jump from a USB microphone to a, I call it a proper microphone. Some USB microphones are great, um, but I mean uh, uh, an XLR to XLR based microphone and an audio interface. So the the processing of the audio is being done externally to your computer and you'll end up with clearer, cleaner audio and better quality audio. Also, get a pop shield uh, and either a good padded space. I don't care if it's pillows and duvets and mattresses or uh, whether it's foam padding or uh, a reflection filter behind that microphone. Um, just get something that you can get a decent quality of audio without echoes and uh, without background noise in it as well. Um, the sooner you get to this, the better. Uh, people are going to be judging you on your raw audio. Um, I've heard some people say to just don't create anything until you can create good audio, and I don't think that's true. I wouldn't put low-quality audio into professional spaces, um, but I would certainly, even with low-quality audio, you can start the process of recording, you can start enjoying those recordings, and you can get amateur jobs where people are just creating stuff for fun. Uh, and I, I think that's a great place to start to develop your craft, to develop your skill, and go on from there. Um, with recording and etiquette, uh, this goes on to things like on some, if, you, if you're on a site where you are auditioning for jobs, your audition is being sent with your profile, with your um, bio, bio, little bio that you put in there, your biography, where it talks about where you got started in voice acting, what you're good at. It comes with all your history of jobs. It comes with who you are. Um, slating is not something that you need to do on those sites, and it is taking up time before they hear your audition. Um, if you're just sending a file to someone with none of your profile, so if you're contacting people um, via emails through open castings or on sites in that way, then slate, because they don't know who you are. They're just receiving an audio file. Um, when you're auditioning on sites where they know who you are already, because it says they've got your biography already, so they know loads about you, you don't need to slate. You don't need to do that on top. Um, you're essentially just taking up their time when they've got potentially hundreds of people auditioning for the same role. And so they just want to hear, is this person at least able to be shortlisted for this role or not straight away? So that kind of etiquette is certainly important. I would also say in a lot of things, People want to hear your voice, not your uh, whether you can find good royalty-free music behind your voice. Uh, and if you, your background music is too loud, they're not going to hear your voice properly. So how are they going to know to hire you? So with the majority of auditions that you're doing, just make it your voice. Your voice, clear as possible, no processing, no background music. Uh, if we're talking things like show reels. Yeah, you want the full processing, you want background music, you want to be able to hear your voice in context. Um, but if it's for an audition, get them your voice at a good volume, nice clean audio, nice quality. Uh, you've put the effort into acting the role or crafting the voice. Um, I'd also say it's worth checking and certain, certain sites want this, certain, certain sites don't, uh, but it's often worth giving two or three versions of the same line, uh, just so somebody can hear your variance on that that sentence and how it's spoken. Uh, but don't go on for too long. Uh, generally, on, 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 on an audition, you want to give a, a, may, maybe a minute to three minutes, something like that, sometimes up to five minutes if it's a, a very long piece, uh, just so they have a flavor of your voice. 
any longer than that, the likelihood is they're not going to listen to it anyway. Uh, but also they just want to hear your voice and whether it's suited to the role and whether you can act um, rather than can you just read through this entire block of texts. I've had auditions for things like audiobooks before where they've given me the entire audiobook. Obviously, I'm not going to give the entire audiobook as an audition. So you pick a section, usually the beginning, and you give them a segment of it. And it's the same with video games. They'll usually give you a few lines to read. Read a few lines. Don't go on forever. Uh, if they give you a lot of lines, just read through them. Uh, if they give you a few lines, do them. And then maybe do them again. Maybe do them again. Um, always be polite, but always be clear with what you're saying. Um, so in terms of etiquette, it, it does come down to a bit of common sense of treat, treating people as you would wish to be treated. Uh, if you want to be treated like a professional, treat other people like a professional. It doesn't matter if they're an indie, indie developer or if they're an amateur developer or if they're just somebody doing a project for fun. Treat them like a professional because ultimately all these people who start out doing small jobs, doing fan jobs, they'll probably become your peers in future. They'll probably become professionals in future. So the sooner you start treating them like that, the sooner they start respecting you. And you should always be respecting to them. So onwards from that, there's a little bit of help. Where can you get some jobs? Where can you uh, get auditions? Where can you send your showreels to? And then we'll move on to the things like the money aspect as well. So where to get jobs uh, come from a variety of different places. I've already talked about a couple of talent sites, things like uh casting call club which has a lot of amateur jobs on there but there's also the occasional professional job on there as well uh things like star now which is mainly an acting site but they have a specific section for, for voice acting now uh mandy.com has separate accounts uh for actors and voice actors um so you can sign up for just the voice acting one and just audition for voice acting jobs on there and then Having a, a Mandy account and a Star Now account do cost money. It's not a huge amount, but it, it costs like a either a monthly fee or a yearly fee, or I think you can do it either which. Uh, then there are larger talent sites, things like Voice Bunny, Voices.com, Voice123, so on and so on and so forth. I can't give you opinions on all of them because I am not signed up to all of them, nor have I been signed up to all of them. Um, it's worth looking up online stories from people who have signed up to these sites don't look at the stories on those sites because obviously they're going to want to put their positivity forward so they're going to give the success stories uh things like reddit's a great source uh for finding people talking about those sites and whether they've been useful uh i've certainly had work through mandy.com i've had work through star now i've had work from casting call club i've had uh work through just contacting people on reddit uh there's things like a voice work thread on reddit uh and voiceovers on reddit and things like that uh i've contacted people directly through twitter uh yeah i i've also had people just contacting me th directly through my website and word of mouth uh which is ultimately a great thing you can also get i've, I've also had uh voice acting work through uh recording studios and producers so when i've gone out to recording studios um i've worked for the either the studio or an overarching company and they've enjoyed working with me so they've said can you come back i've got another job that needs a voice actor or i'd like to hire you again for a different job with a different company uh so getting that those relationships set up and having a good working relationship with people is really important um so in terms of where to get jobs yes you can find a lot of them online uh, some of it you can find through just emailing people. Uh, if you are just emailing a company cold, be aware that you are and approach them as such. Ask them what you can do to help them add value to their company. Explain that you're a voice actor, you're looking for jobs, you're looking for work, you love their company and you will need to look into their company to show that you love that company. Hopefully you're applying to them because you love them and say, I love this game that you did. I really like the voices in this. I'd love to be part of a project like that. Uh, do you have a company that you already use for voice acting? 
because uh, I would love to be signed up to that? Uh, or do you hire voice actors directly? Um, who is your casting director that you use for voice acting? Uh, and so on from there. Uh, essentially, make sure that you're talking to the right person. Uh, make sure that you're giving them good, clear information. Don't go on too long. Don't waste their time. Because uh, if they're just getting cold co contacted by thousands of people and they just don't want to know, if you go on too long, it's going to waste more of their time. So just be clear. Who do I talk to? This is what scenario I'm, I'm, I'm coming from. Here is a link to my voice. How can I voice in your video games? Just, just try and approach them with respect, with politeness, and with the appreciation that their time is valuable. Uh, and it's the same with contacting someone directly on Twitter, directly on uh, Reddit or other social medias through Instagram, whatever. Uh, just be polite, be respectful, and you can approach people. Uh, or you can look on talent sites. You can also look at things like uh, getting agents. Uh, agents for voice acting is a very difficult thing because obviously most agents are for actors in general. And they will also look for uh, voice acting jobs. Uh, I haven't got an agent myself. I would love one, but I don't just want to sign up to any random agent. I would rather an agent want to work with me uh, and see the, the work I've done and gone, have you got an, a got an agent? Because I am one and I would like to work with you. Uh, I think agents, agents essentially need to work for you. And it's a case of why would they work for you? If they're taking commission, it means that they're going to work hard because they want you to get the best role possible at the highest rate possible so they get good commission. If you're paying monthly for an agent, then they're still going to get paid whether they find you jobs or not. Their incentive is only on reputation based. And if you've not done very much work yet, and if you don't have a reputation that is going to increase their reputation, then you paying them the money is going to be no guarantee that they're going to find you jobs. Uh, so make sure that the person you're signing up with is already a casting director, is already getting people jobs, is already getting, has contacts and uh, the ability to find you jobs in the field that you want to work in. But also make sure they want to work with you, make sure they understand who you are as a person and how to best put you forward for that job. And make sure they're professional, make sure that they are polite and respectful and work hard in the industry. Uh, so obviously with all those jobs, that's putting yourself out there, but then how do you get paid? How much should you get paid? And the dreaded question at the bottom of this, should I work for exposure? In terms of getting paid, yes, you should get paid. In, in theory, you should always get paid for everything you do because you are working. You wouldn't have a plumber out to fix your plumbing and then go, that's great. I'll tell everybody about what a great job you did plumbing. And uh, hopefully you'll get a bunch of work from that because I know a bunch of people who might need plumbing. So if you go and do voice acting for somebody and they said, great, I'll, I'll share on social media that you did my voice acting. That's not payment. That's not looking after you. That's, that's, that, that's working for exposure. And uh, exposure isn't, it doesn't pay any bills. And uh, often exposure is a is a nothing uh, scenario. So yes, you should always get paid. Uh, in terms of getting paid, that can be interpreted in several ways. I I have done uh, I have done voice acting in the past where uh, I've done it in trade. So I've done voice acting for somebody and they've done something for me, be it artwork or um, deliverables or uh, things like game keys, vouchers, that kind of thing. I have done that in the past where it's been really fun doing uh, voice acting in exchange for something. Uh, and effectively, that is still getting paid. So that's that's still useful. Um, and it's still somebody valuing your time, valuing, valuing you as a professional. And in terms of how much you should charge, the rates can vary wildly. Uh, up on the screen at the moment, you can see the, the categories of radio, television, internet, audiobooks, Corporate, IVR, ADR, gaming, cinema, animation, voice of God, and additional chargeable items. All of these sections have can have wildly different rates. Um, it depends on the context of, be, of it being used. It depends on the company that's using you. It depends 
are you going out to their studio and recording for them there? Or are you recording in your own studio and uh, sending them audio? Because one's going to involve things like travel costs, expenses. Uh, if you're staying overnight, things like hotel costs and so on and so forth. So uh, all of this needs to be taken into account when you're doing charging. Uh, this These categories uh, are taken from the site uh, Gravy for the Brain. They've got a uh, a, a sort of a pricing, a charging sheet up on there. Uh, and there are a variety of sites that give you advice on how much you should charge depending on what type of jobs. I'm not going to run through all of it because I, I don't want to sit here and read amounts to you uh, for all these different categories depending on how long you're voice acting for. Um, things like in video games, if you're just doing a uh, dramatic read for video games, uh, then that can be one rate. But if you're doing things like uh, efforts, which I talked about earlier, that's your grunting noises of being hit or hitting someone with a sword or grabbing onto a ledge and lifting yourself up, those kind of efforts. Those efforts could also take the form of things like screaming, shouting, uh, yelling to military people to take cover and uh, doing... Uh, sort of semi video game based voice of god work so you know the flag has been captured the enemy has captured our flag those kinds of voices um but things like efforts can sometimes be very hard wearing of your on your voice as you can imagine if you do death screams for a half an hour it's going to shred your voice it's going to going to going to wear on your voice and obviously that wear and tear is something that that is should be taken into account when you're talking about how much you should be paid for this job. If somebody's going to pay me to to talk for half an hour in a soft, lovely voice, uh, I'm going to charge them one rate. If they're going to pay me to 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 scream for a half an hour at the top of my lungs, I'm going to charge them slightly more. It's a harder job. It's a more difficult job. I would also say it depends on where this job is coming from. If I'm talking to an indie developer who wants to do a little video game that is uh you know one of their early projects i'm going to charge them a low rate or uh, something that is affordable within their budget i'm going to talk to them about, about their budget and give them a customized quote uh if i get approached by ea and they want me to voice a football player in fifa it's going to be a very different rate because i'm going to be dealing with a much larger company there's going to be a lot more uh admin involved a lot more paperwork involved the likelihood of me doing uh things like um redos of lines uh, alterations to the lines will be covered in there there's going to be a lot more commercial use and exposure as part of that voice acting job as well so i'm going to it's going to be a, a higher amount uh based upon the the company being a larger company as well so it can vary a lot now the should i work for exposure question i hate i hate this question because ultimately the answer is no. You shouldn't work for exposure because exposure isn't a real thing. It doesn't matter if somebody is this huge, I don't know, YouTuber, social influencer or, or massive company. Are you doing voice acting work for them for free? isn't necessarily going to get you anything. I think there are certain scenarios where you can work for free. Uh, the two main ones I can think of is, first of all, a passion project. If you see a video game that you love and they want voice actors for it and you want to offer your voice for free to be in that game, go for it. For your own personal satisfaction, because you like the games they make or the game that you're auditioning for, because you love that game and you want your voice in that game for you, it's fine. I think you can offer that for free if you want to, but it's a personal passion project. You are not going to get anything for it. Don't do it for the exposure because it's a popular game. Uh, I wouldn't do voice acting for free for Fortnite. You know, it's a huge game. It's it's a it's a popular game in theory. There's loads of exposure there, but the truth. I'm not going to benefit from that exposure. I don't feel personally attached to that game. I don't care about that game. So I'm not going to feel any benefit for it. So it's going to feel like I'm putting a lot of work in. I'm going to be doing a lot of work for nothing. And that's not respectful of you. 
that's not respectful of your time, not only from their perspective, but from your own perspective. You need to respect your own time. You need to respect your own professional ability. And I would say the other scenario where it is okay to work for free is if you want it for your portfolio. Now, this is not the same as exposure because nobody else is doing the work for you. Exposure implies that they are going to somehow get you out in the world and show you off as a voice actor. Uh, and that's maybe they'll do that, but the likelihood is they're not going to do that. That you, you will have a credit in that game. The chances of people seeing that credit is slim. But if you see a project that is big and you want it on your portfolio because you will use it as a pr promotional tool, then that is another potential opportunity to work for free. If I was approached, let's again use the EA FIFA example, I, I'll voice a footballer in EA or an announcer in, in an EA F FIFA game or whatever. Um, if I was very passionate about doing sports games or sports casting or football in general, and I wanted to do more in that field, I might do that job for free to add to my portfolio so that I can approach other genres of game in that same way. Uh, if you wanted to get in something like a Madden NFL football game or, or uh, one of the hockey games or whatever, it would mean that you can go, okay, I've done this one thing for free so I can get these other paid jobs by using this as an, as an example of something I've done. This is not exposure because it's not them promoting you. It's you using it as a tool of your own portfolio in order to get access to other jobs. I would still be careful about doing this. I don't think you have to do this. This is not an essential or necessarily an always useful thing to do. But occasionally you may see something and go, I don't want to turn that down. I want to do that job. Don't do it for the exposure. Do it because you love it or do it because you want it on your portfolio for you to use to put out in that world. And to me, those are the only occasions where really you should do work for free. So we'll move on to health. Health is a huge thing in uh, voice acting. Obviously, rather than a musician, uh, let's say using a gu guitar and changing the strings on the guitar, oiling the wood, looking after the instrument, making sure the pots are clean and have no crackle, making sure the pickups on the guitar come out nice and clearly, making sure the action's good on it. Your instrument is your voice, and you need to look after it in the same way. You need to make sure that your health is good. Now, when I say voice care, things like being aware of your voice, having good control over your voice, uh, will do things like keep it in good health. You don't want to be putting loads of vocal fry on your voice. Uh, this is vocal fry. Uh, that kind of crackly aspect of it is bad for your voice. Now, you might need to do it for certain characters and for certain roles. But if you're doing it for certain characters and for certain roles, give yourself rest periods. Look after it when you're putting it through extreme stress. When I talk about things like the efforts we were talking about earlier, shouting, screaming, um, calling out to your buddy in combat, that kind of thing. Again, that puts strain on your voice. Do some, take a break, have a hot drink, have some water, look after yourself. I would also recommend things like I use Vocal Zone, which is actually a singer's um, tablet, which looks after the throat and helps with sore throats. Um, hot water and honey and a little dash of lemon uh, tastes nice, but is also good for your throat. Try and, try and hydrate often. And when I say hydrate, I don't mean, oh, I'm about to do some voice acting. I'm going to down a pint of water. You need to be hydrating the day before you do voice acting. Uh, try and get at least a, a, a liter a day. I've got a, uh, a water bottle I keep um, by my voice acting space and I always keep it full. And it means that throughout the day, I'm taking sips of water a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. And it means I'm ready for tomorrow where I'll be doing the same thing, which means I'll be ready for the day after. Try to get into a regular habit of having a good sized water bottle and going, I must drink this entire bottle every day. Your body will thank you because your bathroom habits will be much more uh, regular. <laughs> um, 
your skin will thank you as well, but your throat will definitely thank you. And that will reduce things like lip smacking noise, um, sort of all, all that sort of salivary noise will be cut down as well because you are well hydrated and your throat won't go as sore. Um, Self-care is an important thing about being a voice actor, about being self-employed in general. Take time to get yourself into the right headspace to do voice acting. You're going to be sitting in front of a microphone, essentially being someone else. You might be crying. You might be upset. You might be angry. You're going to be putting yourself into some unusual emotional scenarios, which aren't what you are actually going through. Take time after that and take time before that. Clear your head. Uh, I've, I saw a, a day in the life of a voice actor once where a voice actor, uh, she got up every single day, got washed and dressed. And the first thing she did was go for a walk. She just took half an hour to an hour going walking around the block, walking into some woods nearby where she lived. And she would just get out in nature for a while, clear her head, clear her worries of the day, clear what she's going through in her life. And then she'd come back, go into her studio sit down and voice act for about four hours. She'd then stop for lunch and do admin after lunch and then finish early for the day. Her actual voice acting of the day was only about four hours long. And four hours work a day sounds like a really small amount, but that four hours work was intense. She was doing script after script after script, job after job after job. And that intensity in voice acting is not like an office job. In an office job, you do a bit of work, you chat to your colleague, you know, you might be typing stuff in, you might be checking your phone or whatever. A general office work day is not an intense scenario. It's doing the job throughout the day. Voice acting, when you're in front of that microphone and the record gets hit, you are 100% on and you are not taking breaks. You are doing the job. So, you need to put in those bricks. You need to look after yourself, not just physically, but mentally as well. Uh, another part of that is exercise. Again, as I spoke earlier, things like your ability to control your breath is very important. I like going running. Uh, I did uh, four 10K obstacle course runs last year. Uh, the year before that, I did two half marathons. This year, I'm doing an ultra marathon later on in the year. I'm raising money for for mind the mental health charity for doing that um so yeah i enjoy doing running some people it's bike riding some people's rollerblading um some people's rowing uh, i would recommend an aerobic exercise um because that'll help with your breathing but generally try and stay in in rough shape it'll also help if you do uh mocap motion capture uh, because you'll still need to be doing physical work in your acting as well uh, another aspect of health, mental health, is dealing with rejection. Now, as I said earlier, we're not in competition with other voice actors, nor should you be comparing yourself with other voice actors. When another actor gets the job over you, it's because the casting director decided that they were the right person for that role. That doesn't mean that you were bad. It doesn't mean that you didn't do the job well. And it doesn't mean that that person is better than you. They're just different. If you take rejection personally for every role that you audition for, you will not last in this job. So when you audition for a job, give it everything. Give it the best performance. Be proud of your performance when you deliver it. And then forget about it. If they come back and want you to do more, great. If they come back and hire you, fantastic. If they don't, that doesn't matter. You still got the experience of auditioning for the role. You still gave it your best and developed your craft, which makes you a better voice actor. So you against yourself are better for having done it. That means that every audition you do is a successful audition. Because whether you get hired for it or not, you're developing your craft. You're becoming better as a voice actor. And that's another step on your journey. If you take those rejections personally, when you don't get those jobs, it's going to put you off doing audi auditions. I'm not saying that I mean, this is an ideal scenario. I'm not saying that every now and again, you're going to be disappointed that you didn't get a job. That's going to happen. But try not to take it to heart. Try not to take it personally. Don't compare yourself to others. And don't be overly critical about what you do. 
because we're all learning, we're all getting better, and we all will get better the more we do. Uh, and that comes to hand in hand with self-motivation. With self self-motivation, you're going to need to get up, get in front of a microphone, and work. If you're self-employed doing this full time, this is your job. You're going to need to be able to push yourself to do that every day. Some days, if it's not a good day, you need to be self-aware enough to go, I'm not in a good headspace for this. If I do this acting now, people are going to be able to hear on my voice recording, which is supposed to be a happy role, that I am not happy. Because you can hear these things. You can hear if somebody is smiling. A great exercise to do is to read through a happy piece smiling. And then read through that same happy piece. Keep keep trying to put the happiness in your voice in your voice, but frown and don't smile the whole time. Listen back to them and you can hear in the one that you're smiling a more genuine happiness. And it's the same thing. If you come into your studio space or your recording space with baggage, it's going to make the job harder. And it's going to mean that your auditions and your acting isn't as good as if you come into it with a good mindset. And when I say good mindset, you don't need to come in ecstatically happy every day. Lovely if you can. Um, but just with a clear mind, with an open slate and with the willingness to accept the role that you're working on. So self-motivation, really important. And part of self-motivation is the people who are around you, the things that are around you, the space that you have, and the support that you have. Uh, they say that you are the sum of the 10 people you spend the most time with. Uh, family you can't choose. Hopefully you have a supportive family in the work that you're doing. But if you don't, your friends become even more important because they become your support network. Um, if you are surrounded by friends who tell you that you won't be able to be a professional voice actor um, or who think that being self-employed is a waste of time and they just want, they just think you should get a proper job, it's going to be 10 times harder for you to get further. If you surround yourself with people who boost you, who look after you, who want you to succeed, who celebrate your successes, who, who want you to be the best version of you, then it's going to make your job 10 times easier. It's going to make it so much more fun. And if they are also pursuing those goals as well, you can celebrate their successes, which improves it even more because then it's a reciprocal relationship. You're looking after each other. You're buoying each other. When one of you is down, the other one will pick you up so that when that person is down, the other person will then pick them up. It means you're looking after each other. And that's a true support network when you are boosting the people around you. And make sure that you're not just friends with people who boost you and you don't boost them because they won't stick around. They'll go. Yes, they may boost you in the short term, but once they realize you're not looking after them too, they'll be gone. And then you're left with no support network. So look at the friends around you, look at the family around you and go, who's who's here for me, who I am here for them? Invest in those people, look after those relationships. And I'm not saying you should dump all of your friends who aren't interested in voice acting. I'm just saying that Maybe spend more time with the with the ones who are, who are interested in your voice acting. I've got creative friends. I've got driven friends who aren't in media or the creative industry, but because they're interested in my life and they support my life and my decisions, and I'm interested in their life and support their life and their decisions, it's still a good relationship to have. It's still good to have those people around you because, again, they'll give you energy when you have none, and you'll give them energy when they have none to pursue their goals, for you to pursue your goals. They're respectful of who you are and you're respectful of who they are. And that's a, that's so important to have a support network when you're self-employed in general, um, but when you're doing creative media and voice acting. Um, that encouragement will see you through and will help with your motivation in doing the job day by day. 